Hi guys, welcome to another Flight Deck 2 Sim tutorial. In today's video, we're going to look at the engine failure shortly after V1. It's something that's been requested a lot and I've been putting it off, putting it off. Got myself some rudder pedals and it's something we're going to try and replicate using the PMDG NGX in FXX Steam. Now, to make this as realistic as possible, we'll be simulating a flight from London Gatwick to Corfu using live weather. We're currently on stand 20 in Gatwick and expecting runway 26 left for departure. Weather conditions are pretty good, it's nice and summery in the United Kingdom at the moment. There's a light uh, southwesterly wind, 240 at 8 knots, scattered clouds at 4,000 feet, temperature of 21 degrees, dew point of 11, and the QNH is 1016. Now, the departure we're flying today is the Bogner 1 Mike. I don't want to go into so much detail because the engine's going to go bang at V1. We're not actually going to fly it. And I could spend really a good hour talking about all the information needed to fly the engine failure after takeoff profile. Now, a lot of information uh, is actually readily available online. So, in this tutorial, I'm actually just going to fly the profile. And if you have any questions, you can leave that in the comments section below. Now, secondly, like with all my tutorials, this is not to be used for, for real-world flight training. Now, although the information is based on the operating procedures I teach and use, they must be tailored and changed so I can actually operate this multi-crew aircraft single pilot on a desktop simulator. Now, the guidance presented in this tutorial is purely for non-professional computer simulated flight. Now, the aircraft's all ready to go. I'll get it uh, pushed back and the engine started, and you can meet me at holding point Mike 1, runway 26 left, for our flight to Corfu. Alright guys, we're at holding point Mike 1, runway 26 left. Well imagine we've been cleared for takeoff, surface wind is 240 at 8 knots. So onto the overhead panel, let's turn all the forward facing lights on. Strobes are strobe and steady. Onto the MCP, LNAV and auto throttle. And captain will select the weather radar on and the transponder to TARA. We'll confirm we're now clear left and clear to the right and we have been cleared for takeoff. So. Let's talk about what's going to happen on this profile then. Well, the engine fail, uh, engine will fail shortly after V1. I'm going to use rudder to maintain center line and then rotate a little bit slower than we would do with two engines, around one and a half to two degrees per second up to an initial target altitude of 12 and a half degrees. And we won't do anything until 400 feet where we're looking at heading select. The only thing we're going to do is raise the banding gear for possible to climb. At 400 feet, we'll then start trying to diagnose the problem and then complete any memory items if applicable. So lining up there, let's get the heading matched onto the runway track, which is 258. Perfect, there we go. So just making sure my seating position is good so I can use the rudders effectively. And let's get going. So start the elapsed timer, set the thrust to around 40% N1. Stabilise, push toga, set take off thrust, light forward pressure on the control column, and using rudder to maintain centre line. Okay, take off thrust settings around 91.2, there it is, take off thrust set indications normal. That's 80 knots, now releasing light forward pressure, just maintaining centre line with rudder.
V1, rotate. rotate, rotation, there's the engine failure, so using rudder to maintain centre line, nice smooth rotation, now we're airborne up to 12.5 degrees and onto the flight directors, pause rate of climb, gear up and we're going to do absolutely nothing till 400 feet, just fine tune the rudder looking at the turn slip indicator, very very sensitive using uh, rudder pedals that cost about 60 quid so <laughs> a little bit more different than the real aircraft and that's it nothing now until 400 feet any master cautions pilot monitoring will verify and then uh, cancel so there's 400 feet we can now engage heading select state malfunction well it looks like engine number two has 0% N1 and an engine failure flag actually if you've got 0% that's the sign of some severe damage you should get a loud bang and associated vibration with that, second this, uh, checking the secondary engine parameters, yeah, no N2 either, so this is quite a critical situation. This is an engine severe damage, uh, probably caused by a seizure, so we need to complete the memory items for that. So memory items are auto throttle if engaged, disengage, thrust lever, engine number two, we now close. Uh, that's the gear warning horn, which shouldn't be sounding, uh, not sure why that has. Uh, engine start lever, engine number two confirm cut off, and then engine fire switch, engine number two confirm pull. That's very uh, strictly done with the other pilots verifying those switches are done, but obviously I'm having to do it on my own. There's the green bar, which is the minimum flap retraction altitude, so we now need to bug up and start retracting the flaps on schedule, and we're going to wait now until V2 plus 15 to select flap 1, which is this little white bug here on the PFD. So this is the perfect time to now contact ATC, so something like pan 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 fly deck to sim engine failure would like to climb to the MSA which is going to be 3000 feet and maintain runway heading standby and at that point there that will be approved and we just maintain runway heading, we don't need to make any turns due to terrain uh, on this departure. So we can now fine tune the up speed. And we're now on this third segment of the engine failure profile, which is pretty much a very slight climb around 1.2%, if not level flight. So there's V2 plus 15. We can now select flap 1 and trimming nose down. And as we accelerate, the rudder becomes more effective. You can use less rudder pressure. And it's just a very gentle acceleration, all under control. Cancel any FMC scratch pad messages at this stage very gentle very calm and we don't need to change the thrust setting either the thrust setting that you calculate even if you take reduced takeoff performance should be sufficient based on the performance margins now we'd only have to increase thrust if terrain was a threat we need to climb above it but if you set too much thrust you can actually have controllability issues around v2 due to something called vmca which you can find out about online so there's the flap one bug we can now select flaps up Approaching the MSA, which would have been set by pilot monitoring, which is 3,000 feet. We only want to climb as high as we need to, otherwise we'd be climbing all day. And we're now waiting the flaps to be up. And we go flaps up, no lights, we can now select level change. We bring up the FMC, we want to set max continuous thrust. We can now safely set that as we're climbing to the uh, safe height, so I'll just select engine number one. Whoops. Oops, set the green bug which is max continuous thrust, climbing at the up speed and we can now engage the autopilot's command A. Now when you engage the autopilot do not let go of the rudder. Okay a lot of people, especially if they've flown the Airbus, do that because they anticipate that the automation will deal with it. But not on the 737, you have to set some rudder trim. Uh, but I'm just going to wait until we level off now. There we go and the thrust setting, oh so sensitive. Uh, thrust setting I'm aiming here for is around 70 to 75 percent, which is a nice thrust setting to maintain around 220 knots single engine. And when I've done that, we can now go onto the pedestal. I'm just going to bring up the PFD here, so I can set the rudder trim, so I can let go of the rudders completely. And we're looking anything between three and five units based on your configuration thrust setting. That works quite nicely. So I'm now gently releasing the rudder, and now I've completely let go of the rudder now. So we've got the rudder trim set and we're nicely wings level, trims in place. And if you look at the control column, it's pretty, well, it's a little bit to the right, but we want to keep it pretty much centered, but that's good enough for me in a desktop simulator. And at that point there, we're now safely at the MSA. 
I've completely let go of everything, the aircraft's flying smoothly. We can now uh, call for the checklist, and in this case we'd call for the uh, engine fire or engine severe damage or separation non-normal checklist. The pilot flying would take the radios from pilot monitoring as he reads that checklist, and at this point we're approaching 25 miles away from Gatwick. Now outside of 25 miles we can't guarantee terrain clearance with the MSA, so we'd request uh, delayed vectors or routing towards a hold, and if you look here there's a very conveniently placed hold just to the southeast of Gatwick uh, called Mayfield, so we're going to route towards there and now we'll look at the QRH for the engine fire, engine severe damage separation checklist. Okay, so we're now routing safely to Mayfield or Mike Alpha Yankee, and all I've done is bring that to the top, you can see where it says Mayfield, hold at Mayfield, and on the whole page I've put the published hold in which is 088 left hand turns and it's actually for a distance of 5 miles as opposed to the standard uh, 1 minute leg so we can do that and execute and now let's have a look at the engine fire severe damage separation non normal checklist so I'm using the QRH provided by the PMDGE well, obviously I have access to the, the most up to date QRH but I just want to use the one that you guys have readily available. There are some differences so if you're on your type rating do not follow this QRH as it has been updated quite a bit uh, compared to 2008. This one was published 10 years ago but it is pretty much the same. Right, so let's have a look at the condition. One or more of these occur. We've had an engine fire warning, airframe vibration with unusual engine indications or an engine separation. Well, uh, a 0% N1 is definitely an abnormal indication. We'd expect it if it just flamed out. So uh, still to be windmilling. That's an engine we can at least attempt to restart. Now, next we need to make sure that we did our memory items correctly. So auto throttle if engaged, disengaged. It's disengaged. Thrust lever the affected engine. That's engine number two. That needs to be closed, which I should close now, which I'm just going to do. There we go. And now I just have to set the thrust back with the other engine. There we go. Uh, engine start lever, engine number two, confirm cutoff. That would have been confirmed by pilot monitoring. Engine fire switch, engine number two, confirm pull. And there was no fire indication, so we don't need to discharge this bottle. And once you've pulled this switch up, you cannot restart the engine again anyway. Um, step six then, if high airframe vibration occurs and continues after the engine is shut down, without delay reduce airspeed and descend to a safe altitude. Now we had none of that so we don't have to apply that procedure. Step seven, isolation valve switch we can now close. Close. Uh, pack switch on the right side we can turn off. This causes the uh, operating pack to regulate to high flow in flights with the flaps up. APU bleed air switch we can turn off. And now it says choose one, APU is available for start, APU is not available. Well, we dispatched with the APU to date, so we want to start that. Because at the moment, we only have one source of AC power, which is from the operative engine. Now, God forbid if we lost the other engine, we'd lose all AC power, but we still have the APU available. But we want to always have at least two sources of APU available. And the APU takes a couple of minutes to start, so this is the perfect, perfect opportunity to just request the latest airfield information from Gatwick as we've just taken off and see if the runway is still open as the engine did explode uh, at V1 there might be bits of the runway available and that couple of minutes it takes we want to utilize to to get that information okay so I've got the latest weather from Gatwick it hasn't changed and the runway is still open so if you have a look here you can see the APU is ready to start now put before putting it on the bus let's make sure the left autopilot is engaged command A otherwise that would trip the autopilot and there we go, we now have the number one engine providing AC power and the APU as well. So balance fuel as needed is the next step. Well you can see we have fuel in the centre tank. If we have fuel in the centre tank there's no requirement at this moment in time to balance the fuel. But if we didn't there would be an imbalance at this stage and you use the crossfeed valve to then balance the fuel tanks back up. I actually have a fuel crossfeeding tutorial if you're interested on how to do that. I'll provide a link in the video description below. At the next step of the QRH then, it says transponder mode selector, we need to turn that to TA only. This prevents climb commands which can exceed single engine performance capability. So the reason we do that is, if you left it in TARA, you might get a resolution advisory due to some traffic which would tell you to climb, and we don't have sufficient climb performance with just one engine available. 
Now, if wing anti-ice is needed, isolation valve switch to auto. We could actually move it to auto, but we definitely don't anticipate the use of wing anti-ice today, as it's 21 degrees in Gatwick. And then it mentions here, plan to land at the nearest suitable airport. Now, today we're flying an aircraft which does not have the fail operational auto land capability, because that's the way our fleet uh, for the company I work for are fitted, which means we need to go to the one engine and operative landing checklist on page 726. Now, just before we do that checklist, we need to do a couple of things. The first thing we need to do is the after takeoff checklist. So, gear to up and off, landing gear to off, and check the air conditioning panel. Obviously, that pack is off due to the engine failure, and that is now set. Confirm the QNH, and the QNH of 1016 is set, maintaining 3000 feet, which is above the MSA. So just entering the hold here, prior to reading the one engine and optive landing checklist, we'd now take the time as crew to deal with some decision making, you know, what's the next plan of action. We would discuss uh, what uh, we're going to do, what our options are, uh, latest uh, airfield information for several airports around the surrounding area, and then we'd decide are we going to return to the aerodrome, divert, or continue to the destination. We're definitely not going to continue to Corfu with one engine, and seeing that Gatwick is just to the north of our present position is probably where we'd decide to go. We then brief the cabin crew using a format called the NITS briefing, which is pretty well known in the aviation industry, informing them what the nature of the problem is, the intentions, how many minutes until landing, and any additional special instructions. And lastly, we do a reassuring PA to the passengers to explain the situation of what's going on. And at that point, we can now start the one engine in optic landing checklist, and that's pretty good timing as we're just entering the hold at Mayfield. So now let's have a look at the one engine in operative landing checklist. Now the condition states here that the landing must be made with one engine in operative and it's for airplanes without the fail operational auto land capability. So step one it says now plan a flat 15 landing. Now at this stage you'd go into the FMC, update all the routing information which I've already done and you'd select the landing weight which uh, based, we don't use the FMC for fuel predictions, we use the fuel flow now. So we're burning about 2 tonnes an hour, let's say we're landing in 15 minutes, that means we're going to burn around 500 kilos. So we can now calculate the landing weight as 62.4 tonnes. And lastly on the overhead panel there's a couple of things you want to do here. You want to update the uh, flight altitude to your present altitude which is the MSA for 3000 feet and then the land altitude which in Gatwick is 200 feet. Now it says for step 2 set VRF 15 or VRF ice. Now we don't need to set VRF ice today because we don't need to use engine or wing anti-ice uh, for our approach. Now at this point uh, we'd actually calculate the landing performance if they've actually updated the newest QRH to, as, a, as a separate point. But you can see here I've actually calculated the landing weight uh, based on our landing weight of 62.4 tonnes. Now we planned for flat 15, all the surface weather's in there, you can see I've selected engine and operative and reverses. We're going to still use reverse thrust on engine number one but I've taken no credit uh, which on a dry runway doesn't make any difference to your stopping distance. And you can see here for 62.4 tonnes with the VRF addition of 5 knots, we can easily use order brake 3 and stop at 18 94 metres. The landing distance available is 2,800. So we can now select order brake 3, and if I bring the FMC up, we can now select flat 15, which is 152 knots, plus the additional 5 knots approach correction speed. There's some guidance here which mentions maintain VRF 15 plus 5 knots, which is what we're going to use today, and we use that speed and maintain that until final approach to assure sufficient manoeuvre margin and speed for go around. Use the engine anti-ice on the operating engine only, or we'll leave those on, and step 5 checklist is complete except the third items, which we'll complete shortly. Now it's at this stage the uh, pilot monitoring would now get the control and the pilot flying would now set up for the approach back into Gatwick and that's what I'm going to do now, I'm going to set up for the ILS approach runway 26 left back into Gatwick. So everything's now set up for the ILS back approach back into Gatwick. In fact, the only thing I've done is set the minimums for this approach, which for a Category C aircraft is 396 feet. Uh, feet. The ILS is already tuned, which is 110 decimal line, and the final approach track of 258 for the ILS. Everything in the FMC don't really need to change. I've already calculated the landing performance. And at this point now, we're pretty much ready for the approach. We now just start reading in the hold the one engine and operative landing checklist deferred items. 
So starting on the descent checklist, it says pressurization, make sure you have the land altitude set. You can see here we have 200 feet. Recall, we check again. Uh, so you should have master caution, ELEC, and that will be drive. There it is, that's for the IDG, which is currently an operative because the engine's shut down. It now mentions to make sure the re, uh, sorry, the order brake is set. So we've got order brake three set. Landing data has been done. VRF 15's been set with the minimums of 396, and the approach briefing is completed. Now it now mentions if additional go around thrust is needed. So we'll always want to use this, generally speaking, because it just gives you a little bit more extra thrust from the engine. So what we need to do is take the uh, engine bleed off uh, engine number one, and we'll do it off engine number two as well, and make the APU provide the pressurization, which is a bit like turning the air conditioning off in your car. You just get a little bit more power from the engines. So having a look at the EQRH, it says configure the pressurization system for a no engine bleed landing when below 10,000 feet. So wing anti-ice switch off, it's off. Isolation valve switch close. Bleed one air switch off. APU bleed on, it says do not open the APU bleed air valve if the engine fire switch is illuminated and left pack switch in auto which it already is and engine number two bleed air switch off. And now the APU is providing the pressurization to the left pack, the engines have been disconnected from the bleed air system ensuring that we have maximum go around power available for the engines. Now let's read the go around procedure review. It says do the normal go around procedure except use flap 1. We maintain VRF 15 plus 5 knots or VRF ice plus 5 knots until reaching the flap retraction altitude. Limit the bank angle to 15 degrees when airspeed is less than VRF 15 plus 15 knots or the minimum manoeuvre speed whichever is lower. Now that's really important because that ensures you can maintain directional control. It then mentions in the event of the go around that we must accelerate to flaps one manoeuvring speed before flap retraction. The next point now is the approach checklist. So let's just make sure we're fully ready for the approach. We have the frequencies for the ILS tuned, 110.9. It's already identified on the PFD. We have India well, uh, Whiskey Whiskey. The standby instruments are set. We can arm the approach on the standby ISFD. And the courses for the approach are set to 258 to 258. And on the QRH approach checklist, a little bit different from my company's, it just says altimeters check, they're set, but QNH 1016 maintaining 3,000 feet. Now, one, for, one more thing we need to do before we fly the approach is the additional deferred item, which is the ground proximity flap inhibit switch. We need to move to flap inhibit. Now, that switch is here, and the reason we do that is because it, we're landing with flap 15. You start getting warnings from the GPWS that just too low flaps, and we definitely don't want to do that because we're using flap 15 today. And that is it. We're now holding on the QRH landing checklist. At this point, we'd request vectors for the approach, or if vectors weren't available, we'd fly the procedural approach. And that's what I'm going to do now. After Mayfield, I'm going to self-vector myself onto the ILS, and then we'll fly the single-engine ILS all the way to a landing. Okay, so now we're directly overhead the Mayfield VOR. Uh, I'll imagine we're onto vectors now for the approach. So I'm just going to roll out onto a heading of 0, 050 0 degrees. And straight away I'm going to update the FMC. Now to do that, because we're under vectors already, I'm just going to extend the centre line from the centre fix for 26 left by doing that and putting them in the intercept course. And that just uh, makes the FMC a little bit tidy. And we can now uh, fly onto the magenta line. Well, we're going to arm Vorlock and fly the localizer anyway. So the way we're going to fly this approach, we'll start configuring very shortly. We're going to intercept the localizer with flat 5 already selected, self position for a 12 mile final. We'll then configure gear down flat 15 at around 1 dot glide slope capture, maybe a little bit afterwards. We try and time it to minimise thrust lever movement onto the approach. And then when we intercept the ILS, we'll read and do the landing checklist for the one engine and operative. So now's a good time to select flat 1. Uh, speed check for flap 1 and just reducing a little bit of thrust there just to help the aircraft slow down as I said we want to minimize thrust lever movement because if you start moving the thrust quite a bit you need to make a new rudder inputs uh, and have to always change the amount of yaw required so we want to try and minimize that as much as possible just going to make a bit of a base leg here let's go on to heading of around 010 degrees aiming to position for as I said a 12 nautical mile final 
Everything's ready for the approach. We'll imagine we've sat the cabin crew for landing. And we'll, uh, imagine we'll get landing clearance quite shortly. But this would be typical if you were flying into Gatwick for either a non-normal situation or a normal situation. You get ve vectored onto runway 26 left. Now we have the flap 1 speed, so we can now select flap 5. Match again the flap 5 speed. Just going to keep my thrust at around 60 to 65 percent just to help the aircraft slow down keeping an eye on when we reach the flat five speed because we're having to manage the thrust ourselves give ourselves a bit more of a base leg let's call it around 350 degrees keep an eye on the dme distance which currently says 16 nautical miles which said it'll aim for a, a 12 mile final at this point here so here we are on base leg reducing to flat five speed that's 170 knots Looking nice and fully stabilised. If we look to the left hand side, can't quite see Gatwick Airport. It's a bit murky today, range of, uh, I think the visibility is around 20,000 kilometres, but it says 10k on the ATIS here anyway. So adding a bit of thrust now, so I don't want to ever get below your bug speeds with any uh, amount of engines, but if you get uh, below the bug speed single engine you get on uh, to what's known as the back of the drag curve uh, induced drag increases and you need a lot of thrust to recover airspeed in that case so really feeding in that thrust now just to ensure we don't get below the flat five speed it's probably a little bit more thrust I have now than you would be required in real life you need about 70% in reality it's probably about accurate actually there we go stabilized around 172 knots we'll give ourselves our final intercept heading Onto the approach. Looks like I'd make a good air traffic controller. Looking like we'll intercept the localizer at around 12 miles, around 15 miles from now. And we'll give ourselves a heading of around 300 degrees. Oh, that's a bit of a sharp intercept, actually. Let's call it 295. And we'll imagine being cleared approach, so alarm approach straight away, which we can do if we're below the localizer and within around 12, 12 miles or so. So speed's good. Just creeping again below the flat five speed, so really keeping an eye on this. We don't want it to ever get this low, adding a bit too much thrust. Uh, this is one of the problems with FSX and the NGX. Like if I add a lot of thrust like this in the real aircraft, there's a significant change in your if you do that. It's quite docile in in uh, Flight Simulator X. It's a lot more realistic in X Plane 11, which is why I tend to use that for my tutorials now. So localizers alive. Just keeping on that speed, having to use a lot more thrust than what would usually be required. There we go, localizer capture, set runway heading. It was 258, but it's just changed it to 259 there on the localizer. Good, 259 set. And the key thing is now we're looking for the glide slope alive, which is the next point at which we want to start configuring. So a nice and low, 3,000 feet, slightly above the platform altitude, which is 2,000 feet, but it's nice and easy to intercept the glide path from this height. And that's the key thing, nice long final, take your time. We don't fly continuous descents when we have an engine failure. Noise uh, isn't really a factor anymore, because we're in a, a pan situation. And noise is definitely not uh, an issue today. Uh, so speed, again, really creeping below flat five speed. I'm going to make quite a few changes, more than I'd expect, but back onto the flat five speed we can now reduce it again just really keeping an eye on that and there we go there's the glide slope alive now the QRH mentions you should, should configure uh, one dot here on the glide slope and we're actually going to wait until just before glide slope capture uh, so we only need to lose about 10 knots and the key thing is to try and time this so you can minimize thrust leave movement and there you can just about see the runway uh, 26 left ahead of us so all looking good all looking stabilized just trying to time this configuration. I think now's good, so gear down and flap 15, match the speeds. And here you can see the speed bleeding off. Hopefully, at the same time, we'll get glide slope capture. There we go. And I barely, well, I haven't even moved the thrust lever. It's timed it quite nicely. So, missed approach altitude, 3,000 feet is set for Gatwick. Just carefully monitoring the airspeed. Might just have to add a little bit more thrust. It's had an awful lot of thrust. You'd usually have about 70%, not around 80, even though we are quite heavy. Right, now we can do the uh, one engine inoperative landing, landing checklist. That's the name of the QRH. And it says engine start switch on the operative engine, engine number one in continuous. It's in continuous. Speed brake we can now arm. That landing gear is down. Flaps we have 15 required, checking the FMC here. 
uh, 15 selected with the green light and the landing lights they are all on we'll imagine we've been cleared to land and let me just check the latest metar that surface wind is 240 12 knots down in Gatwick and there we are we're, we're nicely established at our approach speed just accelerating ever so slightly so just taking a bit more thrust off actually having said that that's pretty realistic now uh, it's around 70 to 75 percent on final approach gear down a flat 15 on a three degree ILS maintaining that speed quite nicely and that's it now when you're on your tight rating first time you ever do this is with the autopilot engaged and then we get you to do it manually flown and when you do your uh, license skills test it also has to be manually flown but if we uh, if you had this happen on the real aircraft on the line you would actually want to maximize the use of the automation so you'd actually probably use the autopilot all the way down to the minimum usage height which for the 737 800 is 158 feet that's the lowest you can go single channel with an autopilot engaged now I will disconnect it a little bit above that probably around three or four hundred feet and I'll try and do the single engine uh, ILS landing now the key thing here is when you reduce thrust the aircraft will want to yaw and you have to use rudder to maintain sense line and when you input the rudder the aircraft will like to roll as the leading edge of the, the wing moves forward you just have to keep the wings level during the, the landing flare there now it's a little bit easier with the the uh, flight simulator x because the aerodynamics the way it works isn't quite the same as it is in the real aircraft it's a little bit more challenging in x-plane 11 and it's very challenging when you first do it in the, in the level d simulator so there we go, 1,000 feet, which is the top of the white bar. We're waiting for the top of the amber bar, which is our stabilised approach criteria point. And you can see here the rate of descent is slightly higher than usual. That's because we've got flat 15 and a much higher approach speed. It would typically be 750 feet, or sorry, 700 feet per minute on a normal ILS. So fully stabilised at 500 feet, let's have a go with the landing. So disconnect the autopilot, all the throttles already disconnected looking at the pappies primarily small changes in thrust if any just a tiny bit high on speed so just taking a little bit of thrust off and just using tiny inputs of rudder the rudder is a very powerful control surface on a commercial plus aircraft 100. plus hundreds checked three reds on the pappies pitching up slightly Minimums. continue and fully stabilized back onto the pappies now back descending again 50 feet look at the end of the runway that's the key thing with a good landing 50, 40, 30, check 20, close here 10. comes my rudder to get onto the center line keep the wings level or oh, floating floating there we go speed brake up we still select reverse thrust on the operative engine okay we still use reverse thrust and using rudder to now maintain center line is 100 knots 80 knots, cancelling order brake, 60 knots, go to idle reverse on the operative engine and we'll take this rapid exit taxiway here to the right. And there we go. Uh, in reality the emergency services will probably be on standby ready to, to greet us. Uh, they'll carefully inspect the engine for any damage and then depending on the situation we can either taxi back onto stand with the operative engine or request a tug. Well, I didn't order that, and look at that, there's actually a fire truck on its way, so uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know if he's seeing us or he's going to go do some fire practice on the old burnt out, uh, whatever aircraft that is over there. But yeah, that's essentially it. Alright, so I'm just going to bring the aircraft to a stop here, I'll clean it up, and then we'll debrief the single engine ILS approach, just that we've flown there. Alright guys, the aircraft's now fully cleaned up, uh, we've assessed the damage, it's pretty good to taxi back onto stand with the one engine remaining, so we'll probably get escorted by the fire brigade in that case. But that was the full single engine profile, and I hope you found that interesting and learned something new. As ever, if you have any questions, feel free to leave that in the comments section. Don't forget to like and subscribe for FlySafe, and I'll see you in another Flight Deck 2 Sim tutorial in the very near future. Take care, and bye bye.